Hi there. My name is Joe Reinhardt. I'm a professional trainer. I happen to work with Cisco Systems in the Learning the Cisco division. And one of the things that I've discovered in my 20 plus years in networking is that a lot of things may come and go. And some technologies, when they come on the scene, can be a little confusing and unfamiliar. And this is definitely true with VXLAN, at least for a lot of engineers that I've talked with. And so I've discovered, as it took me a while to sort of get my head around this concept, is some of the similarities to things that we're already used to. And so I thought it would be helpful to create a little tutorial to basically point that out and kind of compare things and hopefully it'll make it seem less scary. To begin with, we want to have a basic outline to follow because otherwise I'll ramble. First thing we'll talk about is what VXLAN is. In other words, how you may see it, how it may appear because it's newer. And then we're going to back up a little bit and compare it to things we already know. So traditional networking, 802.1Q frame format, then we'll contrast and compare it to a VXLAN frame format. And then following that, we'll do a review of how switch learning takes place, MAC addresses and so forth, and how that com is comparing to what VXLAN does it well, and then we'll just kind of talk about what we talked about. Now, a lot of technologies, when they come on the scene, don't last very long. They don't get wide adoption, or they're too difficult to work with, or there's something else that comes along and supersedes it. You can think back to token ring versus Ethernet. There were reasons why one won out over the other. And some technologies don't stay around. Well, VXLAN seems to be here to stay, but because it's newer, it can seem a little strange. And it may very much seem like this to you. A very exasperating, latest arriving name, meaning it's just another in our great sea of acronyms. And do we need to learn it because it may not be around for a while? Well, it, it probably will be. But the bottom line is it can seem very confusing, unfamiliar, because there's a lot of new terms and concepts and things that seem to break rules that we're already used to. And while that's true in some respects, there's a lot more similarities to things that we've been doing for a long time, which is part of the purpose of the tutorial. So the big takeaway lesson I want you to get is that VXLAN is simply this. It's just another encapsulation method. If you can remember back in Cisco networking, at least, you had 802.1Q and ISL. They were just in different encapsulation methods for doing trunking. MPLS, which, by the way, is very familiar, not familiar, but uh, similar in concept to VXLAN, it was new and it was another encapsulation method. And same thing with GRE and lots of other things. It's just another method of encapsulation. It's not something new and magical and strange and weird. It may seem so at first, but it's a lot more familiar than what you might think. So let's peel the layers back. Let's not think as much about VXLAN and let's talk about what we already know, what we're already familiar with. So 802.1Q frame format. This is a very simplified version, of course, as looking at all what's in the Ethernet header and so forth. But this is basically what happens when you're sending something in 802.1Q. A host is transmitting up to the switch. This is what the frame looks like. Just a native Ethernet frame, untagged, FCS, IPv4, V6 packet, payload, and so forth. But it's sent up to the switch. And then... We have that 802.1Q tag that's added, which is used to distinguish VLANs. An untagged frame would be in whatever the native VLAN is, lots of times VLAN 1. But this tag is associated, and you have 4,096 or so approximate values. And this is how traffic from one VLAN and traffic from another VLAN is distinguished across a trunk. So a packet comes into, or frame rather, comes into a switch, it's associated with the particular VLAN, for example, switch port mode access, then it's tagged with that and then it's sent through the rest of the switch network with that tag inside and eventually it could be removed to the destination. But this is basically what we've been doing for a while and you have this whole range of values used to distinguish different layer two domains. And this is essentially just what, again, is differentiating layer two traffic.
So the bottom line here is we've been doing this for years. This is nothing new. We have multiple VLANs going across a particular trunk so that you see here. And you've got, in this example, VLAN 11 and VLAN 12. And they're tagged with different values so that the switches can distinguish which VLAN this Layer 2 traffic is associated with it. So it's pretty simple, straightforward, nothing overly complex. VXLAN is doing the same exact thing, it's just doing it in a different way. So here again, we start again with a Layer 2 frame that's being transmitted from a host up to a switch, and when it reaches the switch, it's going to be encapsulated just like VXLAN, or excuse me, 802.1Q trunks do the same thing. All right. So in VXLAN, rather than having a 2.1Q tag, you have a VXLAN header. Now, I'm not going to parse through all the fields in the VXLAN header. There's a lot of complexity there. But suffice it to say, it's doing the same thing in a 802.1Q tag here. The difference is this header, instead of just having 4,096 values, has over 16 million values. Sounds kind of like from uh, Austin Power, 16 million. But it gives, it gives the capability for many, many more Layer 2 domains than VLANs are doing, which is one of the reasons why it was invented. By the way, a little bit of network trivia. Arista Networks, Cisco Systems, and VMware were the original consortium that developed VXLAN. And now it's... Uh, you know, been through the standards bodies, but that was the original group that created it. So you have your original layer two frame, and you're fixing this VL, VXLAN header that gives you all of these values. And uh, the term that's used instead of uh, tag is uh, VNID, V-N-I-D, Virtual Network ID, or VNI. And so that's the value that's used to create these various layer two domains. This in turn gets wrapped in a UDP header, and part of the reason for this is because with GRE, it will cause multipathing doesn't work as well. And so if you have multiple links that this is going across, if especially if you're using like a spine leaf topology, GRE doesn't work as well. Although there is a layer two GRE mode, but you run into problems with it. This then is put in an outer IP and an outer Mac, and these last two headers are, I should say encapsulations, are related to how traffic is sent between switch to switch, and we'll talk about tunnels between switches later. But this is the basic idea. You've taken the Layer 2 frame, you have fixed a Layer 2 VXLAN header, you've then wrapped it in UDP, then wrapped it in IP, and then wrapped it in MAC so it can be transmitted across the Layer 2 network. And this is basically what it ends up looking like. So the frame format's different, but there's a, still, again, the basic mechanics of what you're trying to accomplish is the same. And again, to distinguish traffic with VXLAN as opposed to 802.1Q VLANs is you're using this VNID, this virtual network ID or VNI, and you have these much larger numbers associated with it, each specifying a different layer two domain. And again, you can think of it the same way as you would with a VLAN. A VLAN is a broadcast domain, and in the VNID and VXLAN, it works the same way. Now, having looked at all of that and kind of compared at least the frame format of VXLAN and traditional VLANs, now we're going to look at just sort of a basic topology of what we're, again, what we're used to. So you have two switches. Uh, you have a trunk link going from Ethernet 1 slash 24 on both switches. And you have a various workstations that are attached. Notice here the ports 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, and 1, 4, respectively. And you'll see the MAC addresses. And these are obviously artificial, but it gives you an idea of how this is going to work. So you have uh, two in VLAN 11, this will be workstations 1 and 3, and two in VLAN 12, which is workstations 2 and 4. You can see the IP and MACs that are listed here. In traditional networking, if one of the hosts wants to send traffic to another host, it's going to use this process that we're very much used to. 
So in this case, workstation one wants to send something to workstation three. Same VLAN, different switches. But then workstation one's going to send an ARP request because it doesn't know anything about the MAC address of the second workstation. It's this case in workstation three. So let's send out the ARP request. It's received at the switch. You see the frame format here. It's being sent out to the broadcast address. The switch then receives that and floods that out all interfaces except the one it's received on. This is basic networking, CCNA, CCENT level stuff. And it's still sending it out. And it's sending it across the trunk link to the other switch. And this would be true with, with however many trunk links there were from one switch to the other. It's then received on the other side. And what switch one does is it records the MAC address of the frame it received and what port it was on. So basic MAC address learning. So that's where switch one has learned. And now comes the ARP response. Now as a result of this, the switch two has not only learned the MAC address of workstation three because of reading the source addresses, but it also now knows about the MAC address of workstation one as it's sending things back. So you can see kind of both, now they have, there's a MAC address table on both, so anytime it's gonna transmit between them, now it doesn't have to be flooded, it knows how to send it directly. That's traffic within the same VLAN. Now if you're going from one workstation in one VLAN to another workstation in a different VLAN, then you have to have a layer three device to do what we call IVR, inter-VLAN routing. And so lots of times what we do in traditional networking is we have SVI, switch virtual interfaces. And those are required for this inter-VLAN routing to have, happen and take place. So within the same VLAN, traditional MAC learning, between VLANs you have to have some sort of layer three op and layer three device involved for that traffic to go back and forth. And that's basically what's pictured here. So again, very common stuff we've been doing for a long time. Now keep in mind that with this newer way of doing things, there is no trunk link between switches. It's not saying in a VXLAN network you can't have this. Maybe you're using VPC or something like that. But in this case, there's no direct trunk between. So at this point you go, well, on how on earth are they going to be sending traffic back within the same layer two domains? Well, most of the time, VXLAN is using a spine leap architecture, which is different than the core aggregation access or core distribution access network design. And that's beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk about. But suffice it to say, it's different. So the network is not composed of the two switches, as we've seen before, but it looks more like this. You have another switch with connections between them. So VXLAN has replaced this directly connected physical link that we're used to, the trunk links, with a tunnel that's going between switch to switch. And keep in mind that this is going from switch to switch, just like you'd have a trunk link going from switch to switch. This tunnel is very similar to what you use with GRE. GRE is just a basic example because we're used to how it works. You, know, you have tunnel source, tunnel destination, and so forth. But instead of the trunk link, now there's this tunnel that's doing the same exact thing. It's sending traffic between one layer two domain and one la layer, another layer two domain in VXLAN. So that's what's basically been changed there. But it's doing the same basic job. In VXLAN, we call this VTEPS, VXLAN Tunnel Endpoint. Sometimes you'll hear people call it VLA, Virtual Tunnel Endpoint, but it's technically VXLAN Tunnel Endpoint. Sometimes you'll hear the switches that are terminating the tunnel as being called VTEPS, so that's the other thing you can keep in mind. But this tunnel is what's transporting traffic across layer two from one switch to another. Now to give you an example of what I was talking about with tunnels, with tunnels, you're gonna set up a GRE tunnel. And I thought when GRE came out, it was the best thing ever because 15 hops became, what, three hops? It was still 15 hops, you just didn't see the hops anymore, so it was, it was hidden. But using GRE as an example, what do you need to set up a GRE tunnel? Well, you have to have a 
source and a destination across an IP network. So in this case, for example, if, if this was an NXOS switch, you'd have feature tunnel, you do interface tunnel zero, you'd specify the source, loopback zero, then you're going to specify the destination, which is going to be the loopback address on the other side. Notice it's dot nine one on the left and dot nine two on the right, just to make it easy. And you're basically telling the switches that you're going to create a tunnel with these endpoints. So uh, 10, 111, 11191, destination 10, 111, 11192, and it'd be configured the same way on the other side. And that's basically how tunnels are set up. In VXLAN, you have to use loopback interfaces. In the GRE, you can use physical interfaces, you can use loopback interfaces, and so forth. But in VXLAN, it always has to be loopback addresses for your tunnel anchors. So you're going to have tunnel source and tunnel destination on each side tied to loopback addresses. Now, if you have a loopback zero on the left and loopback zero on the right between these two switches, unless you put static routes in the switches, it's not going to know how to reach that loopback address because it's not a directly connected interface. So at this point, you have to have some kind of a routing protocol running between the devices in order to be able to share that information because otherwise the tunnel will never come up. You know, with GRE, you put in your tunnel information and as soon as the destination IP is reachable, the tunnel comes up. Well, if you don't have a routing protocol distributing that information, it'll never come up. So here, typically, you can use OSPF, ISIS, and you can even use BGP in order to be able to have this IP reachability for building the tunnels. That's really the purpose of the routing protocol. And this is called the underlay. The underlay is just an IP network that's used to build the tunnel across. So in this example, you're going to have point-to-point -point interfaces, router interfaces, probably between switches 1 and 3 and 3 and 2. And then you're going to have the loopback addresses. And then whatever routing protocol is being used is going to distribute all that information so the tunnels can be built between the switches. And obviously in larger networks, there's going to be many, many, many more addresses, but the idea is still the same. This is called the underlay. And in many cases, when you get into troubleshooting the VX lane, the underlay is usually where your problems are going to crop up the most. So again, you're building a tunnel, you're distributing your loopback addresses so that these tunnels can be built between switches so it can transport layer 2 traffic. So, so far we've talked about uh, the tunnels, the underlay, the routing protocol that's helping it run, and that's just foundational for all the rest of this to happen. It's an IP-based network. Now, you have the VXLAN functionality being added in. The VXLAN is using these VTEP interfaces as trunks. So this tunnel is now a trunk doing the same exact thing. Notice here, you have each of these switches that are acting as a layer two gateway for each virtual network ID. In other words, workstation one, wanting to transmit to workstation three, is going to be transmitted up into the switch it's going to be tagged with the, notice where it says VNID 10011. It'll be tagged with that. It'll be encapsulated in the tunnel because that's how it knows to send it across to the other switch and so forth. So both of these switches are going to be the upstream gateways for whichever v virtual network IDs, just the way you would with, v with VLANs. Oops, excuse me. When you're using VXLAN this way, going from one device to another device within the same Layer 2 domain, this is called a Layer 2 VNID, or Layer 2 Virtual Network ID. And these are overlay networks you're building over across the IP network. So the packets are transmitted, it's transparent to the end devices, but it's going across the tunnel. So these Virtual Network ID, these Layer 2 VNIDs are very similar to what you would do with VLANs. So whatever's broadcast from Workstation 1 is going to be heard by Workstation 3 because they're both in the same VNID. Just as you have broadca broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic being handled by the various switch mechanisms in traditional Layer 2 networks, it's going to be replicated in the same kind of way in VXLAN. 
With VXLAN, however, because it's an IP-based network and there isn't the physical connection across, you have to emulate the, the broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast functions and flooding and so forth that you're used to in a Layer 2 network. And so what ends up happening is you end up with a multicast group that's mapped to a Layer 2 VNID or Layer 2 VNI in order to be able to replicate traffic. So in this case, our request comes in. It's sent to the multicast group. It's then sent down to the individual switches that are participating in that. And as a result, that's emulated. There are other ways to do it with BGP, and it's called ingress replication, where you're just essentially using multiple unicast streams. But the multicast group is usually the most common way to do it. So you have your Layer 2 VNID, all your broadcast, ununicast, multicast functions, bump traffic is being used by being mapped to this multicast group. But typically, you'll have a multicast group mapped to a Layer 2 VNI, although there's lots of design issues that you can look at later, but that's the basic concept. So now, the whole process we looked at and are used to with Layer 2 traffic being transmitted and MAC address learning happen, happening, now let's look at how it's being done with VXLAN. So again, Workstation 1 wants to send something to Workstation 3 in the same VLAN. And as far as the end devices are concerned, it's the same VLAN. So Workstation 1 sends an ARP request. So far, it sounds exactly like what we've been doing up to this point. The difference is, when it gets to the switch, the switch has mapped that VLAN to the Layer 2 VNI, so there's a direct, that's why it's a gateway. So you have a VLAN then being mapped into a Layer 2 VNI and then from a Layer 2 VNI mapped out to a VLAN on the other side. But the fact is, it receives the ARP request, puts it in the VXLAN headers, and it forwards that broadcast to the multicast group. The multicast group then replicates that to the other side. And notice here, the MAC address table off to the left. Notice here, it's learning the MAC and the virtual network ID and then the interface that it's associated with. Incidentally, when you do a show MAC address table dynamic on a VXLAN switch, anything that's going across a tunnel will be showing the tunnel interface rather than the physical interfaces. And uh, it's kind of interesting to look at. And off to the left, you can kind of see the frame formats that are being used for the overlay and underlay. So it's being sent to the multicast group. Multicast group then replicates it to all the other leaf switches. That's basically what the switch one and two are. All the way across. And notice here, it receives the request, and then it'll do the response back like we're used to. And now, notice it's showing the various mappings now with the switches. So now you have a complete table that's been created, and then you get a response going back. And when you get done, you end up having, you still have a MAC address table with entries, but instead of it going from a physical port to a physical port, you're going from a physical port across a tunnel to another physical port. All right. Once that happens, just as in a traditional Layer 2 network, everything's going to go across directly as unicast. When you're going from one device in the same Layer 2 environment, so going from VLAN to VLAN across VXLAN, this is called VXLAN bridging because you're sending traffic within the same Layer 2 VNI, just like you would in normal traditional networking, where one broadcast and everything else is heard across all the other devices attached to the network. That's essentially your bridging traffic. And it's called VXLAN bridging. Again, that's traffic within the same Layer 2 VNI. So it's like intra-VLAN traffic like we're used to. When you want to send traffic to a different Layer 2 VNI, just like you would a different VLAN, you use VXLAN routing. And this is like intra-VLAN routing, but you're doing it with VXLAN. So you'll have another construct called a Layer 3 VNI, which is essentially your Layer 3 gateway. So you want to go from Workstation 1 to Workstation 4. So you'll, it'll go up. It'll be mapped from VLAN 11. It'll be encapsulated in VXLAN. It will then be switched over by Layer 3 to the other Layer 2 VNI, 
and then transmit it across. So it's just like inter VLAN routing, you're just doing it in VXLAN, and that's what the Layer 2 VNI is all about, or the Layer 3 VNI. So Layer 2 VNI is all your Layer 2 broadcast domain. Layer 3 VNI is when you're doing routing between Layer 2 VNIs. And that's the basic set of concepts around VXLAN. There's, there's a lot more technical detail, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the flavor of what everything looks like. So what have we talked about? To begin with, VXLAN improves on VLANs, 802.1Q specifically, by allowing up to 16 million distinct Layer 2 segments. And typically you'll take a VLAN and you'll map it to a VXLAN Layer 2 VNI and then map it back out on the other side so the device end devices don't even know that, that any of this has happened. But 16 million Layer 2 segments. VXLAN, in order to be able to transmit Layer 2 traffic from one switch to the other, is going to do it across an IP-based network. So it's using a tunnel system instead of physically to connected trunk links. VLANs are typically mapped to Layer 2 VNIs in VXLAN. So you just think of the Layer 2 VNI as just being like an 802.1Q VLAN for all intents and purposes, and it's going to be very similar. The basic networking mechanics between VXLAN and 802.1Q are very, very similar. You're just doing different encapsulations to accomplish it. And then if you want to go between, or you want to go in between um, Layer 2 VNIs, you're going to use a Layer 3 VNI, which is routed traffic. But when it's within the same Layer 2 VNI and or VLAN, it's going to be VXLAN bridging. Thank you so much for paying attention to this. Hope it helps you and uh, continue your adventures in networking. Take care.